Hello, I'm Gene Canning, host of Journeys of an Artist. This week we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to look at the highlights of the 12 shows we've already done and hopefully provide you with some insight into how the show and the traveling and meeting these artists has influenced me not only as an artist and conservationist, but as a person. You can't help but be influenced when you travel with these guys. I hope you'll join us this week on Journeys of an Artist. Journeys of an Artist is made possible in part by a grant from Grimetti Reserves and the Grimetti Fund, Magumu in the Serengeti Desert, Tanzania. I've been an artist and conservationist for over 15 years now. Having the opportunity to travel the world with artists who share my love of art has been a real treat. Now we'll look back at some of the highlights of Season 1 and look at my personal Journeys of an Artist. Africa is an amazing place. The landscape, the people, and especially the animals have influenced me both personally and artistically. Traveling to Africa with Guy Koliak was a real honor. We shared some amazing experiences. His knowledge of lions and Africa in general allow him to capture the real essence of this spectacular land. I've learned a lot from him. You've been to different countries all over the world. And why Africa? What is the draw here? I don't know, it's just a draw. The second time I came here, I felt like I was coming home. I suppose if there's reincarnation, I must have spent a lot of time here. I can see why. This is something I never thought I'd be lucky enough to be part of. These weren't the Maasai that we're used to seeing tourists. We were in a remote area of the Serengeti Plains. These people were living much as they did thousands of years ago. We were so caught up in the moment that even Guy decided to jump in and have some fun. God bless all here. I also invited artist John Banovich to be my guest on the show. John is most known for his African wildlife paintings and for the work he does for conservation. With the help of the staff at Sabora Camp, we were able to go on a very unique journey over the Serengeti and Gramati game reserves. Not a bad place to go for your first time in a helicopter. Flying over the plains allows you to see just how vast this landscape really is. The low horizon really makes for some dramatic sunrises and sunsets. Can you see the herds of wildebeest off in the distance? Flinton Coombs, our pilot, was great at showing us the various habitats of this area, as well as taking us right in on the action. They don't look that big from up here, do they? Here are some notes right out of my journal. I think it says it all. What a rush. There can't be too many experiences that can give a person more of a feeling of freedom. To hover mid-flight is something else. Then to circle around, go low and swoop over an animal, all pretty darn amazing. Here on safari in the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, we encountered a lion relaxing after a big dinner. He was a beautiful big male. It made for a great photo opportunity. Yes, look at his right paw, up above his ankle. Right at his ankle. He's got a wire it. snare, and that's from set for a bush meat for a small antelope. But he walked into it, and that's why he's so testy, because it didn't make sense for me to see a lion in the, in the bush. In, in, the, uh, in the Serengeti, that is so nasty towards people. But I can promise you that snare has made him cantankerous. circulation. Well, it eventually become a man-eater is what happens because it'll lose the paw and it can no longer hunt. 
Our last stop in Africa was the island of Zanzibar, otherwise known as the Spice Islands. These islands are filled with history and very unique art forms, as well as the obvious spices. Lots and lots of spices. Well, now what is that? Nutmeg. That's nutmeg? Yeah. <laughs> it looks, it doesn't even look real. Arabs and Indian valued these spices as a treatment for digestive, liver and skin complaints. But both nutmeg and mace were held to be aphrodisiac. <laughs> yeah, that is why ladies, women of Zanzibar here, when they find entertainment celebration, local wedding, so they do find this nutmeg instead of a strong alcohol. Really? Yeah. Mm, so something. they just take this dried one, create to be powder, mix it together with a dish of porridge, then they drink. When they drink, they feel high, and then they get to dance all the night, <laughs> chanting, singing. <laughs> have to get some more. Yeah, yeah. Have, have to get some more of these yeah, fruits. Yeah. <laughs> they have already uh, removed shy, so wow. they can do whatever they like. Can I? And this is how can they I? harvest cinnamon. It sure must take a lot of work to squeeze that into that shaker I have at home. Oh, boy, does that smell good! Wow. All right, cinnamon tree. The root of this tree smells like a vix. So uh -huh. most of the people they do use um, as inhalation for flu and cold. The oil of this is good for cooking and as, and as, uh, as inhalation for flu and cold. I didn't realize so there were so many of the spices too. that were used for medicine and for eating. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coconut trees are good for more than just their famous fruit. The leaves can be woven into baskets and as you'll see soon a whole lot more. Thank you. Hmm, I just love coconut milk. I've never had it this fresh before. A Zanzibar Coca-Cola. It's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. And now for all the wonderful <laughs> gifts they made me. My new hat. Look at this, it gets better. My new tie. It's still not done. And I'm drinking the coconut this came from. And my cool new rays. Uh. Now tell me this isn't cool. For all you single guys out in America, cheers. This is the new bar trend. <laughs> Zanzibar also gave me a chance to swim with dolphins, scuba dive with green sea turtles, and get up close with these great old guys, the giant Aldebrow tortoise. And I mean up close and personal. And then there were these guys. This is just absolutely amazing for a wildlife artist to be able to come in like this and study these red colobus monkeys for this. I could stay here for days. You know, you see a lot of times you just get glimpses of them back in the forest, but I'm actually getting to be within two and three feet of them sometimes here to get to study the light, how it hits their forehead, their eyelashes, to study their fingers. It's an amazing experience. They're all around us here too. And considering there's only 2,350 left in the world, it's pretty amazing to think that we probably have 30 of them at all right in a little group here. You can see there's one right up above me here right now that I've been watching, and there's some other little ones that are going all around the trees. This is great. Look at the young one on its, hanging on its stomach, looking down at me right now. I made sure I went home with lots of reference photos of these guys. They had such great character. I knew I'd be painting them at some point. Look at him laid out there. And here it is. I titled this painting Memories of Zanzibar. I can't look at it without thinking of these little guys and their bunker hairdos. This painting was done for a group working to save the rainforest. This is one of my favorites. I listen to him roar all night long, fiber to the ground under my tent even. And the next morning we drove about a kilometer from camp and there he was in perfect golden light. I love painting Africa. I have enough ideas already to keep me going for years. If I had to pick just one subject to paint for the rest of my life, this would be it. The possibilities are endless. The size of the animals in this part of the world also dictated the size of many of my paintings. All my life I've loved the outdoors, canoeing, camping, fishing, you name it. To share my love of the outdoors with artists with the same feelings towards preserving our natural world, well it was something else. Dwayne Hardy is both an artist and an educator. His knowledge of art history is extraordinary. His impressive dioramas are in some of North America's most prestigious museums. I was most impressed with his love of painting outdoors and his ability to capture the light and depth of a landscape. I 
also learned that Duane is always on the move. In our short time together, we journeyed from Algonquin Park in Ontario to Regina, Saskatchewan, to Yellowstone National Park, and to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Let's take a minute, though, and visit one of our stops, beautiful Georgian Bay in Ontario, Canada. Exactly. Stevens Island Getaway presented us with a painting opportunity we just couldn't resist. Isn't this landscape something else? Such nice forms for painting. I don't get to paint outdoors as often as I'd like, so this was a real treat to be able to spend a few hours here painting with Duane. What is it that makes you pick a certain spot over another spot? Uh, mostly shapes. Shapes and light. So what is it you see here? Well, it's a, the shapes are very strong. There's strong vertical shapes in the landscape, strong horizontal shapes in the landscape that uh, add interest to, uh, to the large, air, large masses of water and sky. So it's really a painting of sky and water with some of the verticals of the white pine, the leaning pine trees, um, creating interest within that fairly broad, broad expanse. Mm -hmm. And the color, we're getting close to uh, sunset, so the color is always rich and beautiful at that time of day. Sure is. Pretty tough life us artists have, isn't it? Duane and I painted right through until we lost our light. We filmed another show in my home area, Algonquin Park, Ontario. On this show, we featured artist Michael Dumas, who incidentally is from the Algonquin area. This was also the only show that we filmed with snow on the ground. We're here in the winter right now, but have you got a favorite time of year just in general or for paintings? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, all seasons have their own charm and experiences that are connected to them. But I have to say that, that winter is, for me, in terms of, especially in terms of painting, in the imagery that comes with winter, there's a natural simplification to the scene. You know, like we're kind of down to the bare bones of the land. You know, all the, all the superfluous has been stripped away. You know, th this is the the essential Algonquin. You know, even even the even the birds that we would see, uh, mammals that we would see, these are the year-round residents. These are these are the yeah. true the true beer, Algonquin the species that you know, that's all year round. And I think too, uh, the fact that it's the less experienced time of year for visitors to the park also make his makes it a little bit like um, sort of a a little more special. Yeah, Anything. discovering something is a, is a little more of the secret life of the park. Mm -hmm. Michael and I were lucky enough to join park biologists as they track wolves from the air using radio telemetry. Isn't that view amazing? Look at all those snow-covered lakes down there. A lot of these are routes I've canoed. This is just a tad bit faster way of getting around though, don't you think? We should all have one of these. And there's our first wolf sighting. And look at all the tracks in the area. Obviously, this pack has been spending some time here. I've been coming to Algonquin Park all my life and have only seen three wolves. With the help of the helicopter and the radio callers, we were able to find five packs in our time in the air. Shows you that these animals really are out there, but if they don't want you to see them, you're not going to see them. Not too darn often, anyway. Maybe I could have gotten the pilot to drop me off on one of these lakes with a nice big stake tied around my neck. I bet you I'd have some luck finding them then. This was my second experience in a helicopter during this first season. Am I a lucky guy or what? Rod Crossman taught me to fly fish and more importantly became a friend and fishing buddy and took me for a wild ride down a river in the Adirondacks of New York State. A lot of my early memories are watching my my father uh, fish those streams of this part of New York so yeah I've, I, there's a big spiritual connection uh, with me in this area and I was so pleased that we were able to come here. I'm really glad we did. Now you started your career painting more wildlife subjects and then just I slowly sure up broadened it out to more of the outdoor theme I think wasn't it? Right yeah I sure did. I, I started off uh, 
loving, I, I, I still love wildlife art and still enjoy it. And every now and then I'll kind of integrate it maybe into one of my sporting paintings. But my, again, getting back to my, my dad, he was a lineman for the power companies and worked outside and had this lunch, black lunch pail with the thermos that used to hook up into the lid of it. Oh, and, God, yeah, and I remember them. Flip the lid open and the thermos is up in there. Yeah. Of course, when he'd come home from work, it was the big deal for myself and my brother and sister. And every now and then he'd come home after working outside and, and he'd get home and he'd put that lunch pail on the table and see Rod, go look in that lunch pail. And so I'd run over there and open it up and there might be a turtle or a rabbit or some wildlife that he found Something when he was Something they found clearing the lines. And then, uh, yeah. And then I would raise it for a while and let it go, and it, oh, I just got such an appreciation for uh, wildlife and nature and the way nature works, the whole miracle of of creation, basically. And you know how you, you know, know how it is being an artist too yourself. You you gravitate towards the things that you, you love, know. Yeah. and you know. And I think those are the things that you do well. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, has really taken over from the wildlife and I, I still integrate every now and then maybe a, an animal into one of my fishing paintings or upland game paintings or something like that. And the upland game stuff I'm kind of doing a comedy because I still, you know, grouse and woodcock and quail and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. It's just the natural for me because I, I used to paint those birds before I integrated them into my sporting art. Thanks to Rod, fly fishing has become a new passion for me. This painting was inspired by the wolf research we were involved with during the filming of Michael's show. I was so taken by this work that I became an active member of the research project. North American subjects are an important part of who I am. They always say, paint what you know. Remember, if I said I could only paint one subject, it would be African. But thankfully, I'll never have to make that choice. This painting was made up of a collage of reference. The deer was from my area, actually touched my lens he was that close. The property is mine and the rack was my grandfather's from Nova Scotia. I also paint a variety of wildlife including birds such as ducks and owls. I love it all. I often say I'm a painter of the outdoors. It's the common theme in all my paintings. On Journeys of an Artist, we've traveled to some really fascinating places. Here's a look at some of the more unusual experiences we've had. Steve Hanks and creativity go hand in hand, and his Albuquerque, New Mexico studio was to die for. Steve and I had traveled to New Orleans shortly before Katrina. One of the most fascinating things about being in a city like this is the amount of history that there is here. For example, that apartment right up there is where Tennessee Williams wrote Streetcar Named Desire. I think that's so cool that we're right in where all this history is. Oh, I know. You, you walk the streets, you never know what you're walking by, yeah. but oh. you can still have the feel for it. Now, like I've said before, it's, uh, it takes me a while when I come to a place like this to feel that I have, it takes a while that I feel I have the right to paint a place like this. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the right well, to paint? You've got to have come here. You've got to know it a little bit better. You've got to be a part of it. I mean, I don't live here, and you don't want to insult people mm -hmm. who do and come in and do a painting of their town mm -hmm. unless you've experienced it a little bit and you have the feel for it. Well, it took me seven years before I painted a painting outside really? here. Of seven of years? Yeah. Wow. But uh, uh, I did a lot of interior stuff, and most of my stuff is very intimate like that, mm -hmm. and it's not street scenes and things like this. But every now and then, you know, it, you can come together in a scene and you want to do a piece that represents the feel of a city like this. Mm -hmm. Steve and I also traveled to Southern California. He spent much of his early life in this area and still travels here as often as possible. The beach and its beautiful reflections are one of the most important backdrops to Steve's paintings. He also introduced me to a new sport, surfing. I knew surfing would be hard to learn, but boy was it tough. I felt sorry for Steve. It must have killed him to have to surf on these beginner waves. He grew up as a surfer. Me, I grew up as a skier.
And now for another water adventure, we joined artist Randall Scott on a shark diving trip off the coast of the Bahamas. Randall is well known for his paintings of World War II airplanes sitting on the ocean's floor, as well as his other paintings of the sea. We are here to dive with sharks, so down we went. We were told we could find a good number of reef sharks around this old sunken tanker, which is located in about 60 to 70 feet of water. To witness one of these monsters of the sea down here is a really eerie experience. Makes one wonder what happened to bring her to rest down on the ocean's floor. Did the crew survive? Did they do battle with a previous hurricane? I'll tell you, I'm really starting to see why Randall is so drawn to these underwater relics. My first shark, now this is what I came to see. Isn't this great? Talk about getting to know your subject. I never dreamt we'd be this close to them. I actually had personal contact with three of them myself. I couldn't believe how they came right up to us. I'm thinking jaws and teeth. This wasn't your ordinary tourist dive. Randall had made arrangements for us to get a real taste for, and maybe that's the wrong choice of words. I mean a feel for, ah, uh, that's not that good either. Anyway, he wanted us to have a great experience and we did. It was great to be with Randall as he gathered his reference. You can't just make this stuff up. To get a feel for what Randall has been talking about, we made a dive in an area where a small aircraft had crashed. Though it wasn't from World War II, and it wasn't covered to the extreme that most of his paintings are, it still demonstrates how life takes over these planes, and how hard their landings must have been. This little grouper was as curious about me as I was about him. We shared at least two minutes checking each other out. I have to say this is one of my favorite diving memories to date. And now we take a trip back in time with artist Bradley Schmel. His historical paintings capture a moment in time. I always wondered how someone can capture the feeling of battle without actually experiencing it. But after spending a few days with him at a reenactment in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, I began to understand how he does it. I became a participant in the Battle of Cedar Creek as a member of the 47th Infantry of Virginia. Back jumping, left, right. It was intense marching towards one of these. Hard to see, but that's my company. One hundred of us all firing a volley together. Unforgettable. These reenactors accepted me into their ranks full-heartedly. It was an honor to be part of this with them. I can't imagine holding the line waiting to fire your musket, all the while having your enemy within yards of you, intent on stopping you from doing exactly that. Really something. As you can see, it was an eventful first season. Lots of great experiences in art and travel. To close this week's show, I want to share some other subjects I love to paint. One is this old hay bale. Pretty simple, but filled with thoughts of the country. 
or this one, which is part of Canada's permanent art collection, because everything about it says Canada, and many parts of the States for that matter. I love to paint these types of scenes, though I also enjoy doing paintings that can be used for fundraising, such as this painting of hooping cranes that was used to help raise funds to reintroduce a migratory flock of these magnificent birds back to the wild. I close by showing you my painting Wash Day, arguably my most popular painting to date. I'm probably most known for my paintings to dogs, but in reality they're only a small part of who I am as an artist, but an important part nonetheless. Well that's our show. I've really enjoyed this first season. I hope you've enjoyed it too. And we'll see you next season on Journeys of an Artist. Bye for now. Journeys of an Artist is made possible in part by a grant from Grimetti Reserves and the Grimetti Fund, Magumu in the Serengeti Desert, Tanzania. To receive your own VHS or DVD copy of this program for $24.95, call 1-800-869-2665 or write to the address on your screen. When ordering, please refer to the program number on your screen. That's 1-800-869-2665.